That song bothers me. It bothers me because I'm not sure I can live up to what I just promised. What we just promised is that it would be a glorious thing if, like the apostles, we could die serving God. I plan on dying serving God. But not that way. But it encourages me that that's where I need to be. And so we sing these songs and all I can ask is we need to think about it and pray about it and become the type of people that we just pledged that we're going to be. And this morning, as I was doing my Bible reading, I happened on Deuteronomy chapter 6. So I asked Brother Curtis to read the first three verses. This is the commandment, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord has suggested. And you all realize I just changed the most important word. These are not part of the ten suggestions. For they're not suggestions at all. They were in fact the commandments of God. And so he gave these commandments to Israel. To teach them that they might do them in the land that they were going to possess. That you and your sons and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes. His commandments which I command you all the days of your life. That your days may be prolonged. And I had Brother Curtis stop right there. But that's not where Moses stopped. And that's not where God, our Father, stopped. And he said, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord your God has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. And he answered, Have you not read them? And we move from Deuteronomy over to the new covenant. And now Jesus is in a discussion And the Jewish leaders had taken some positions on the family and marriage and how that is supposed to be carried out. And they were not according to the commandments of God. They were not in line with the teaching of the scriptures. And so Jesus said, and you got to see how this must have stung the scribes and the Pharisees who were the leaders of, of the teaching of the scriptures. And Jesus asked, have you not read? I wished every time we read that, we could read that with the incredulous voice that I hear. You should have read. It should have been part and parcel. It should have been memorized. Have you not read? He that created them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. What Jesus just did for us. See, he went all the way back to the very beginning. To show us this is God's purpose for man. There would be a family. A family unit. That family unit comes about when the man finally becomes a man. And he leaves his father and mother. Not necessarily emotionally. Not necessarily 
physically, in the realm of care. But what happens is he now becomes the head of his family, the head with his wife. And the two of them now have become one new man joined together. And this was the family unit. And from that family unit, he was to cleave unto his wife. And the Hebrew writer, the Ephesians writer says, Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church. Love your wife. Even as you love yourself. Putting her needs at the beginning. And then it goes on. Loving us. He says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And this is what I have experienced, both here in our country and in China where I have gone, and from talking with my friends that have gone to other parts of the world. This is where it breaks down. This is where men have often abdicated. And rather than being the father that they should, they've abdicated from the family unit. The leaving of the father and the mother and the cleaving to the wife and the loving of your wife and now teach your children and the problem comes. I just read this two weeks ago. The latest family poll shows that 23%, according to that poll, of the children in America are raised without a father. Y'all realize physically they had a father. But he wasn't their father. He didn't live with them. He did not teach them. He did not love them. He did not instruct them. He did not bring them up in order that they could leave and cleave unto their wife and have their children and teach. But I found out this was not true in China either. The one of the biggest problems that's happened in China is the breakdown of their family units. I was taken aback that as I was trying to teach in the classes, what I began noticing is we usually had two times the number of women as we had men that would come to these classes. The first question when I ask, is there any particular subject you would like me to teach this morning? And without hesitation, they said, would you teach what the husbands are supposed to be like? Because they did not know. They had not seen that in their fathers, and they're not seeing it now in their wives. And then I was just in a meeting with a friend of mine who's made trips to Africa, and he took his wife with him the last time. And while they were there, the women had a large, large group of women, and they kept her busy all day long, teaching women to women. And over in the men's class, it wasn't that popular. It wasn't that populated. And what they discovered, my friend said, was they had the same problem there that I saw in China that we have in this country. And what God expects is that we would have a family unit made up of a wife that honors her husband and a husband that loves his wife and a husband that teaches his children to love the Lord. Now that started clear back in Genesis. When God chose Abraham, do you realize how many times Abraham is mentioned in the Bible? I'm going to challenge you. 
If you don't have a computer program that will do this, go get you one of those strong concordances. You know those great big books with little bitty type? And look up Abraham. And start counting the number of times and the number of books that Abraham gets mentioned in, even way into the New Testament. And what made Abraham so great was his absolute trust in God and his trust so much that it poured out into his children. For God said, I have chosen Abraham that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. And so the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken unto him. This was a remarkable passage to me. What made Abraham a chosen person was the fact God could see that his faith was so great it was going to be imparted to his children and to his household. Servants and slaves, grandchildren, the neighbor's children, that he was going to be this kind of a father. And so Abraham became known as the father of the faithful. And I like that phrase. But then as you move, God gave this new covenant to Abraham's descendants. God revealed unto them that he had chosen them to be special and he gave them a special law straight from God to them as a people. And he said, Give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known unto your children and unto your grandson. The grandsons did not experience Egypt. The grandsons did not experience the manna. The grandsons did not experience all the things that this generation had experienced, but they could experience it through the telling of the story. So when your children ask, what does this mean? A friend of mine preached a sermon on that, and he added one word just for emphasis. So when your children ask, what does this mean to you? Can you imagine how Abraham would have told the story? How Joshua would have told the story? Those that had lived through this and come out the other side receiving the promises of God, they told it under their children and they told it under their grandchildren. And so God commanded these words, which I'm commanding you today, they shall be in your heart. That is, your whole being will be consumed by the very teaching of God. And you will then teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. This is what God expected of the family. And to the fathers he said, here's your job. Talk about him. Talk about him. When you get up, when you go to bed, and every point in between. When you go out of the house, when you come in the house, when you're walking down the way. Every part of the day. Teach your children so that they can know what God has. So let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what do these stones mean to you? You shall say to them. Now the children of Israel had come up to the Jordan River and in its flood stage as God had parted the Red Sea, he now parted the Jordan River and they walked across on dry land and Joshua said, Take these stones, a few of these, and bring them out. And so each one of the tribes participated, and, and they built an altar out of these stones. 
So that when the children saw the stones, they would ask, what is that all about? Why are you doing this? Why do you stop in your tracks when you come to this pile of stones? When they ask, you can say, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And so, these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And you know what we have? A memorial. A memorial so that our children, and this happens in every family, when mom and dad and the children sit in the assembly of God and we worship God together and we partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the Lord and the little hands, every time the was passed, they were reaching so they could take some and we had to you know, put their hand down. And you can hear the little innocent voice. What's that? Why do you do that? And God has given the memorial so that within the family unit, the fathers can take them aside and say, this is what that is all about. I was there. I saw it. Now, the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh generation, they never saw that. But if the fathers had seen that and were so impressed, I've tried to picture this. And you know, all I picture is that Charlton Heston movie and where they uh, tried to do that. And today, they remake that and they use uh, animated graphics to, to portray this. But I have my own picture. How in the world could it be dry ground? What happened to the waters downstream? Did they stop too? I don't know. How high did those waters pile up on the upstream side? Did the fish swim over to the edge and look to see what's happening? You know, and I can only try to visualize, but I'm like the sixth generation, but I want you to know. The father, when he told the story, it wasn't, a whole hum story. It was the experiencing of God in covenant promise and passing this on to his children and his grandchildren so that they heard this story and they began to have faith. Proverbs is filled with this and I'm not going to keep all of them, but I just picked. Hear the instructions of your father. And give attention that you may get an understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words, keep my commandments and live. There is the father in the family situation. And this is the instruction that God gave. Fathers, Teach your children well. Teach your children what it means to love and to serve God. And thus, there's a pile of commandments. But you get to the New Testament, and this doesn't change. It's still the family unit. Fathers, teach your children. You know, on Facebook today, for you that are on that, you're going to see picture after picture after picture. And I was just quickly scrolling through, and all of a sudden, here was a face I recognized. The first congregation that I preached in, we had an elderly gentleman that had been an elder in the Lord's Church back in California, but now had retired from preaching and was now a cow farmer. 
raising cattle in Oklahoma. And he built two houses. One was his house with a great big living room. And the other was his daughter's house, the son-in-law's house. And in that house was a whole pile of children, grandchildren. And I remember the first Sunday I got there to preach and I preached and I did the, the best I could. I have no idea how good that was. And when I got done, he met me at the, the back door. Now, he's a big German background man. And he put his big arm around my shoulder and he said, we want you to come and have lunch with us. So we packed up and we went over to his house for lunch. And they didn't have furniture yet. They had just gotten into this house. And so here was me and my little son and all those grandkids. And we got down on the floor with Grandpa. And Grandpa started playing a game. Who am I? And he would start telling a story of what happened to him. And all of those grandchildren and me, we were to pick out. How did they know that story? And the answer is because that wasn't the first time that happened. And when they would come over, he would talk with them about the Bible and about the people and about Abraham and about David and about Jesus and about the apostles until they had this story living in their life because it lived in his life, one of the most godly men I've ever been around. And he was a picture in my mind of what God wanted in a family unit. Teach your children and your grandchildren so that they can know this. In the book of Hebrews, they were suffering, and the Hebrew writers encouraging them. And he said in chapter 12, it is for discipline that you endure. You don't quit. You keep going. You straighten out the problem and come back to the right way, and you walk in the paths of righteousness. It's discipline of the Lord. God deals with you as with children. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, of which all become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. And I'm going back now to where I started. 23% of children in America do not have a father in the house. They've not seen what a man really is. They've not seen how an adult male will deal with the problems of life. They've not seen what real love is. And it's not sex. Sex is the icing on the cake, but you can't just eat the icing. And what happens is, sex is the bounding it's part of the, the physical uniting of the cleaving together. But there has to be more than that. But what these children are seeing is that's the only part. I hope your family is different. I hope that talking about this, you can look back and say, that's not my story. My dad was there. My dad played baseball with me. My dad took the time to get down on the floor and have a Bible story with me. If we had that, our country and the world would be different. I can only hope and pray 
that we have taught enough children and grandchildren that when they grow up, they will not be like their fathers. We sang faith of our fathers, and I'm standing here going, not those fathers. Please don't have their faith lack of. Please. We need godly men. And one of the reasons I love the church is that I get to experience that. Now I look out and I start counting the fathers. Thank you. Thank you for being what God wants us to be. And then we sing faith of our fathers and we realize that even without the actual, literal, physical father of the genetic line. I have spiritual fathers before me. That grandpa in Oklahoma, he's now dead, but he is alive in my mind. Because, you know, almost every Sunday after that, we went over to his house and ate lunch and sat on the floor. Even after we got the furniture, and played some kind of a Bible message game. I, I found those to be the best Bible classes I've ever sat in. And we can do that. And we can be that. And so, Hebrews says, We had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not rather be subject to the Father of spirits than live? And that brings us to the greatest father of all. Jesus taught us to pray. Our father. How do you feel when you use that phrase? What do you think about when you use that phrase? You are actually now you and the God of all of the universe. And you're talking to him and he has promised to listen to you. And you start. Father. What are the next words out of your mouth? How long do we sit in prayer? How much do we talk to God about? And I'm going to tell you. I need to improve. I talk about this and I realize wherever you are we can get closer and closer to our Father. Amen. And one of these days we're going to be ushered into the very presence of the Father as His children. Welcome home my son. Welcome home, my daughter. Come in and dwell in the very presence of God. And this starts at some point in our life. When I was not a child of God, an enemy of God, in fact, Jesus died that I could be saved. And so the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Galatia, he said, we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's where it starts. That's where the family unit can come back together again. That's where we can be and relate to God and our community and to each other. Fathers as fathers. But above all, we relate to our Heavenly Father. We celebrate Father's Day every day. Every time we pray. We celebrate Father's Day every time we come together for the Lord's Supper. And we remember that God gave His Son. And our children ask, what does this mean? What does that mean to you? 
If I could raise my children again, I'd make different mistakes. I know that. But I'm going to tell you, the one thing I've wished I had done, and I'm not complaining about my children, I love them dearly. And this is the cruel aspect of being a preacher's kid. He's going to talk about you. But I'm going to tell you, the one thing I wished I had done was talk about God more. But I didn't. But I did enough. And so, we remember the greatest father of all by obeying his commandments given through Jesus. And that starts with arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And if you're subject to that, make him your father today and have the greatest father of all eternity. If you're willing to do that, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.